welcome everybody to Hearers of the Word for the fifth Sunday in Year B. We'll go straight to the slides to start our reading and reflection. So our gospel for the day is Mark 1, 29 to 39, an exact continuation of the previous Sunday's gospel. Just to give you a feel for the space, we're still around the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum, and here's a lovely picture taken one afternoon from a boat on the Sea of Galilee. So we'll follow a sequence we've used before, reading and reactions, noticing whatever strikes me about the gospel immediately, noting the place in Mark as, as always, which is important here, and then we'll do a close reading to see the richness of the text and to see if we can let it speak to us today. So here's our gospel passage. Now, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying down sick with a fever. So they spoke to Jesus at once about her. And he came and raised her up by gently taking her hand. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. When it was evening after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered by the door. So he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Then Jesus got up early in the morning while it was still very dark, departed and went out to a deserted place. And there he spent time in prayer. Simon and his companions searched for him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. And he replied, let us go elsewhere into the surrounding villages so that I can preach there too. For this, that is what I came out here to do. So he went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Just to remind you, we're still in Mark chapter one, and it can be divided into a number of sections, as you can see. Mark 1 to, 1, 1 to 20 is preparatory material, baptism and call of the first disciples, preaching of Jesus. And then we get typical days in the life of Jesus in Mark 1, 21 to 45. And our section ends one day and begins another day. As you can see on the right, there's a lovely icon of the raising of Simon Peter's wife. In this first part of the gospel, Mark presents the material in two ways, kind of chronologically and thematically. And in chapter one, it is more or less chronological. And here we have in effect, uh, in our this Sunday's gospel, three or four short anecdotes, the shortest one being about Jesus at prayer. Again, just mapping it a little bit. On the left, we have intro, all the introductory matters, the title, John the Baptist, Baptism, Temptation, the proclamation and call of the first disciples, and then our section, A Day with the Lord. First of all, in Capernaum, where we have a healing, a healing in Peter's house, and healings at the door. And then the next day, Jesus at prayer and the disciples uh, catch up with him and he announces he wants to go elsewhere. So that's where we are in the Gospel of Mark. Before heading on, it might just be helpful to notice that the miracle stories are told in a kind of patterned way. People count the number of sections somewhat differently, but here's one pattern in any case. The arrival of the miracle worker at the locale of the sick person, a description of the illness or problem, a request for healing, implicit or explicit, the healing action by either by gesture or by word or in fact by both, the affecting of the mighty deed and the acclamation by the crowd are some external demonstration of the healing. And all the elements are present in the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. The acclamation is not there, but well, the external demonstration is she served them. She was well enough to do that. 
A note as well on exorcisms and demon possession. And this note is taken from Daniel Harrington in his commentary on Mark in the Sacra Pagina series. And he observes, as many scholars do, the following. The ancient universe was perceived as being peopled by a wide variety of spirits, most of them threatening. In fact, humans occupied only a small part of this, this universe. Popular religion, for example, the mystery cults and healing shrines in the Greco-Roman period were very much concerned with liberation from these malevolent powers. Likewise, apocalyptic Judaism thought of the world as locked in a lethal struggle between God and the powers of evil, and therefore exorcism was not uncommon. And just to make an extra comment to myself, uh, illnesses were always attributed to some sort of malevolent power, and so healings and exorcisms were treated more or less equivalently. So we'll go straight into the, the commentary. Now, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying down sick with a fever. So they spoke to Jesus at once about her. He came and raised her up by gently taking her hand. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. So a standard miracle story, so to speak. We have the, the breathless narration of Mark, as soon as, Caiuthus in Greek, at once, Caiuthus in Greek. And that little expression, meaning kind of immediately, is eight times already in chapter one in Mark's gospel. And we notice that Simon has a mother-in-law, so he's married, and his wife traveled with Peter, as noted by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 9.5 on his missionary activity. We don't know the name of either woman, unfortunately. When it says raised, then it's just worth noting that the very same verb is used for the raising of the dead. And in some sense or other, Mark is inviting us to read at more than one level. Raised is used of ill people, as you can see there in the various references across the gospel. And then in the early Christian tradition, raised is used of Jesus being raised from the dead, the very same verb. Taking her by the hand, a, a lovely expression, is regular in Mark's gospel at the various healing stories. In, in my translation, it adds gently. That's not really in the Greek. In fact, it could be a bit stronger, kind of grabbing her by the hand. But in any case, she gets up and she serves them. Now, you might think the poor woman, she's just out of her sick bed, and there she is cooking and preparing food. But in terms of a miracle story, this is proof that the healing has been totally effective. As well as that, service is the word used across Mark's gospel for that mark of Christianity and the mark of Christian discipleship, especially in chapter 10 verses 42 to 45 and very significantly in chapter 15 verse 41. So again, Mark is inviting us to look at two levels. The liberation by Jesus, his raising us up is also a call to service. Furthermore, Mark tells three more stories of acts of power to the benefit of women. And the women are Jairus's daughter, the woman with the flow of blood, and the Syrophoenician woman. So all important stories in Mark's gospel. Now we find ourselves still in Capernaum. I thought a word about Capernaum and Peter's house might be of interest. This is an aerial shot of Capernaum, and I'll point out one or two things. There in, with the little red roofs is a new Greek Orthodox monastery, very beautifully frescoed that you can, you can visit. More or less in the center in white, that's the reconstructed synagogue at Capernaum, which I'll say a word about that in a moment. And then what looks like a flying saucer, in fact is, a new Franciscan church built over what is taken to be the site of Peter's house. And I'll say a word about the particular shape of that building and its importance in a moment. Now here's another shot of the same site and you can see the synagogue uh, in the center and above that, the, the new octagonal church built by the Franciscans. 
there's the, the, the reconstructed synagogue. This particular synagogue is later than the time of Jesus, but undoubtedly stood on the same site because sacred sites are not built over with secular buildings in antiquity. In the foreground, perhaps of more interest, in the, the, with these basalt stones, you can see a typical residential area with steps going upstairs onto a roof and so on and various divisions and walls. And this gives us some idea of what a small first century poor person's house might have looked like. More on that in a moment. This is what I'm calling the, the flying saucer. It's an octagon, very modern octagonal church built over what is presumed to be an octagonal Byzantine shrine over the site of Peter's house. Again, you can see from this angle, the synagogue is now, so to speak, behind us, a uh, typical residential area of the time in the local basalt stone. Now, here are two interesting photographs of the site before the building of the church and before the reconstructing of the synagogue. And I just notice you can see there the octagonal walls of the Byzantine shrine, very carefully constructed around a central feature. And in the photograph on the right, more or less the same picture, but from kind of more on top of it. And this is taken to be a Byzantine intervention to protect a holy site, which then is taken to be the house of Peter. And in fact, there's every probability that this tradition is a reliable one. And there's a close-up of the octagonal Byzantine walls disturbing the pattern of the first century house divisions, as you can see. And then people have imagined before the octagonal construction was built, there must have been an earlier shrine protecting the house by tradition that was Peter's house. And uh, they found there a, on the wall a prayer to Christ, which says, Christ, help us which is uh, in, the, in Greek on the bit of plaster shown in the, in the bottom right there. And before that, the archeologists have imagined what an earlier house might have looked like on the spot. So you begin to see some, some idea of what Peter's house might have looked like before the tradition preserved it and then enlarged it and made it into a holy site. So a very ordinary, regular building, the usual type, even with a sort of upstairs, as you can see. And there's a close up then of the actual house walls plus the Byzantine shrine itself, the octagonal shape, which inspired, of course, the octagonal shape of the contemporary Franciscan church. And the Franciscan church, to give it its due, has a glass floor. So you can see directly down into the shrine of Peter's house very, very easily. So we continue our story. And by now the sun has set. So here's a photograph taken as the sun was setting over the Sea of Galilee. And we continue then in the evening time in Mark's Gospel. When it was evening, after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered by the door. So he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And here we have a double time marker. It was evening after sunset, which is very usual in Mark's soft little tick of the writer. It was still in the Sabbath day, so it's after sunset when it was permitted to carry the sick and people could travel as well. Later on in chapter two, verse one to chapter three, verse six, Jesus will heal on the Sabbath itself. It says there they were gathered by the door. And that's kind of interesting word Episunegmene, which sounds very like the word synagogue. So another gathering, but not in the sacred space. And Mark underlines all who were sick, the whole town, and he healed many. So a, a very generous expression of Jesus' outreach. In verse 24, you'll have noticed those who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, and they're more or less equivalent. Sicknesses were attributed to demons, symbolizing the force or, of course, the experience of evil. And the silencing of uh, the demons, we had that already last week, is part of the messianic secret in Mark's gospel, where the identity of Jesus is concealed from his contemporaries. 
It says the demons knew him. They belong to the world of the spirit and therefore have special knowledge. So just to catch our breath for a moment, at the beginning of uh, his gospel, Mark gives us a typical day, which turns out to be a Sabbath day, and it's a day of victory. And on this day, there are many healings. An unclean spirit in the previous Sunday's gospel, Peter, Peter's mother-in-law, and then the people around the door of Peter's house, all whole, many, and again, unclean spirits. So at the beginning of the gospel, he gives us a Sabbath. There is also a Sabbath at the end of the gospel, after the death of Jesus and before the resurrection, signaling as well victory over the powers of evil. Then Jesus got up early in the morning when it was still very dark, departed and went out to a deserted place, and there he spent time in prayer. Again, you notice the double marker in the morning when it was still very dark. He goes to a deserted place, which in Greek is Eremon, from which we get our word hermit or eremitical, an echo of the desert Eremon, already in verse 12, when Jesus was tempted in the desert. However, there is no desert as such in the vicinity of Capernaum, so a lonely place is more likely intended. In Greek it says he prayed, but the tense is the imperfect, meaning he was praying, suggesting a prolonged time of prayer as Jesus roots himself again in the reality of God. Jesus' source of power is in God, in contrast to what his enemies assert. His enemies assert it is by the prince of demons that he casts out demons, a horrible and repelling suggestion. Simon and his companions searched for him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. He replied, let us go elsewhere into the surrounding villages so that I can preach there too, for that is what I came out here to do. So he went into all of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So Simon and his companions have not yet, yet learned the habits of Jesus, his, his regular prayer, so they go searching for him. And the verb used is a um, slightly hostile one. They tracked him down. And then Peter makes a very strong affirmation, everyone is looking for you, echoing the previous evening at the door where they were so crowded. And then Jesus says, so that I can preach. And the verb used is keruso, from which you get the word kerygma or kerygmatic. And this has a specific meaning. It means effective proclamation, not just words. And you can see the effective proclamation in verse 39 preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And again, these are equivalent activities. His preaching brings about the casting out of demons. So it's effective proclamation. Jesus says, that is what I came out here to do. Now to come out is already used a good deal in this chapter of a demon, of news about him, of a synagogue, of heading out early here in this passage and of Jesus' own mission. It just might hint at a deeper Christology. I came not simply from Nazareth, but from a pre-existence in God. And finally, you notice it says there in Mark, in their synagogues rather than our synagogues, indicating already a break or distance from the mother religion. So a very rich sequence of stories, four really, in very compressed and compact form, illustrating the typical day, evening and morning of Jesus and his purpose and mission. So it invites various forms of reflection and I'm going to offer four. The first story is one of healing. You might reflect on times when you were sick in body, mind or spirit and someone was a Jesus person to you, someone who took you by the hand and lifted you up. Remember them with gratitude. Have there been times also when you did this for others? The second story adds another dimension. People are freed from demons. Have you had the experience of being freed from demons that imprisoned you? Fear, anxiety, guilt, low self-esteem, addictions, bitterness, and so forth. What was it like for you to get that freedom? Who were the Jesus people who helped to free you?
Jesus goes off to a desert place to pray. After a hectic day, he felt the need to, for quiet to ground himself once more. In the busyness of life, do you keep in touch with what is going on inside yourself? How do you keep in touch with God? Where do you find your deserted place? What difference does it make for you when you succeed in taking time out? And finally, Jesus shows himself as a person seeking to break new ground. The disciples want to, him to continue ministry where he is. He wants to move on. What has been your experience of breaking new ground, moving beyond your comfort zone, or trying something you had not tried before? When has this had a life-giving effect for you? So a good deal to reflect on in this compact and energetic sequence of stories offered by Mark. And so we pray. Out of your power and compassion, O God, you sent your Son into our afflicted world to proclaim the day of salvation. Heal the brokenhearted, bind up our wounds, bring us health of body and spirit, and raise us to new life in your service. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. As always, thank you so much for taking part in this short opening up of the Gospel. Again, as always, I hope you found it useful and that the, the richness of the apparently simple storytelling of Mark has been made available for you and for your prayer and for your living of the gospel. Thanks very much.